Okay, so Extinction Rebellion has come out of 30 years of campaigning which has failed. And that's the starting point of Extinction Rebellion. And that's no disrespect to all the people who have been working hard, but facts are facts. Since 1990, carbon emissions have gone up by 60%. The year before last, it went up by 1.6. Last year, 2.7. We've been told, haven't we, for 30 years, the elites, the governments, the politicians, they're doing the reports, they've made agreements, and nothing's happened. And the reason Extinction Rebellion has come along is because people have suddenly clicked. It's not going to happen. We're all going to die, and it's the end, unless we actually do something ourselves. So that's the starting point of April the 15th, I think. Okay. So, what I want to say is that Extinction Rebellion has come out of a long process. It wasn't like three mates down the pub, let's have a rebellion, right? Yes, yeah, so three years ago, academics, researchers, activists came together to ask two fundamental questions. You know, why isn't it happening and how do we make it happen? How do we save the next generation from their deaths, basically? How do we do something about this system that's taking us to destruction? So that's like a massive question. You want to sort of get it right. So that's why I spent like two years like thinking about it, reading the literature, looking at the history of the 20th century, looking at psychology, looking at political science, political theory, you know, the sociology of revolution. And now, like last year, I did a paper pivoting to the real issue last January and we decided right this is it we're going to have this rebellion it's going to be non-violent it's going to be organized it's going to have a decision making structure and so off we went and surprise surprise it's worked <laughs> so as everyone should know who's watching this there was like this big blockade of the bridges last November basically it's a warmer pact you know we we're trying to find out would we get 6,000 people to break the law yes we could because thousands of people are just shitting themselves and going, what the fuck, you know, something's got to happen. And then we've come along and said, this is the best bet, guys. And people have gone, yeah, you know, this is different. Let's give it a shot because, you know, sending an email, sending a donation, A to B marches, yeah, 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 great, but, you know, fuck all's happening. So, like, there's three options here. Like, as we've established, right, there's traditional campaigning, the emailing, sending a check to Greenpeace, all that sort of stuff, A to B marchers, right? That's great if you've got a little issue, but it's not gonna do the business when you're dealing with entrenched power. This basically means the rich and powerful are making too much money out of sending the next generation to their death. And so they're not gonna stop unless something dramatic happens. So the other option historically has been violence. Lots of research on violence, great for getting attention, causing disruption and a total disaster. Right? destroys democracy, destroys relationships. If you win, it usually leads to civil war. It's just beyond bad. So, is there another option? Yes. The third option is mass participation, civil disobedience. What does that mean? That means like thousands of people peacefully breaking the law, people of many different backgrounds, young, old, what have you, many different cultures come together with a single cause in mind and they go out and break the law together in civil disobedience to make sure that change actually happens. Okay, so <clears throat> what does that concretely mean? What it concretely means is what we're doing on April the 15th. I said, this is our best bet like design. So people, you know, watching this might go, well, you know, it won't work or it couldn't work or that's bad with it. Okay, but the key question here is, how good is it compared with the alternatives, right? There's not some miracle thing out there. So the alternatives are, you know, more checks to MGOs or violence. There's, no, there's not like a fourth option out there. The third option is mass civil disobedience. And the literature shows and our research shows that this gives the greatest probability of success. So there's no guarantees, but that's not the issue, right? You know, if a baby falls in off a bridge into the water, it's not like you either stay there or you jump in, right? It's not some third option. <laughs> you know, life doesn't give you endless options. There's these options. 
So that's what we're going for. So specifically, what does this mean in terms of April the 15th? Okay, so as I see it, there's five key elements to this model we're going for, and we're calling it the civil resistance model. Now, it's interesting that people all around the world have been taking down governments, you know, forcing regimes to come to the table for, for a good 100, 200 years. So it's not like anything unusual, right? It just hasn't happened in the Western world for a while. And this civil resistance model is the most successful model. So it goes something like this. Loads of people go into the capital city and they close down that capital city until something dramatic happens. And specifically, there's five different elements to it. So the first element is you need a lot of people. Now you can't do this with 50 people, right? We need to get around the country and mobilise loads of people to come down on the 15th. So you need like 5,000, maybe 10,000, maybe 25,000. You don't need like millions, all right? That's not what you need, but you need a fair amount. So that's the first thing. So the second thing is the capital city. You have to go to the capital city because that's where the government is. That's where the elites are. That's where the media are. Like, these people don't care about, you know, closing down something on the periphery, you know, a coal station or whatever. What those people care about is whether they can get to work in the morning, whether they're losing lots of money. And the reason why the civil resistance movement go to the capital city is that's the most effective strategy. You're right there, underneath the windows, as it were, of the elites. Okay, so the third thing you've got to do is break the law. There is absolutely no point trying to do something on climate change if millions or thousands of people aren't breaking the law. What breaking the law does is create a dilemma for the opposition. They can either let you get away with it, in which case you've won, or they can repress you, like use violence or arrest you, in which case you've won as well because you produce lots of publicity. So that basically creates a tension, it creates a political drama. So what breaking the law means in this context is non-violently doing something which is illegal, usually like sitting on a road, painting on a building, that sort of thing, okay? It doesn't mean violence, it means civil disobedience, non-violent direct action as it's called. Okay, so where are we, one, two, three, four? Yeah, so th this is the other issue, which is violence, right? So it has to maintain what's called non-violent discipline, which means respect to ourselves, to the people participating, regardless of their background. Secondly, respect to the general public. And thirdly, respect to the police. So the idea here is not some big moral crusade, right? The idea is we're sitting down the road, speaking our truth and doing it in a respectful way. As we've already established, like being aggressive, you know, being insulting, that creates a general spiral into polarization and into social violence, which is not where we want to go. All right. Okay, this is probably the most important thing, number four, which is you have to do it day after day. So there's no point, everyone knows like A to B marks, march, you know, is pretty useless. Like we know that we've gone on the Iraq war, war march, blah, blah, blah. Great, you know, everyone feels great and nothing happens. And if the truth be known, going down to London and blocking the road for a day, great, everyone feels great, but nothing's going to happen. And the reason is, is because the following morning you're not there anymore. So it's like, well, that was a bit of trouble, but it's gone. So what we need to think about here is a labour strike. Think of a labour strike. You know, the tube goes on strike, something like that, or some group of workers go on strike. What happens? On the first day or two, you know, no one's really bothered. At the end of, you know, four or five days, it's an issue, it's in the paper. And after two weeks, it's crisis time, right? You know, the accountant comes in to the bosses and says, you're losing so much money, you've got to negotiate with these guys. So that's basically how the non-violent sort of civil resistance model works, is causing disruption day after day, because it's exponential, if you see what I mean. You know, there's some sort of, you know, multinational cafe, I won't mention any names. <laughs> Just use your imagination, right? So day one, they're going, ah, that's interesting, you know. Day three, you know, they've run out of salad cream, right? It's a bit of a hassle. Day five, the bread hasn't arrived crisis so it goes that's what i mean by exponential you know start off at two goes to four goes to 16 goes to 99 and that's when the shit hits the fan that's when the government is forced to go uh okay what do you want in the same way as bosses do all the time right so that's the fourth thing and that's the real thing we've got to get across to people don't come out down for a day you know come down for the week come down for two weeks whatever it is
Okay, and the last thing is great, which is obviously has to be fun. <laughs> okay, life is short, let's have some fun, okay? You get a big adrenaline rush from breaking the law and doing something sexy with other people, right? Do you know, that's probably the wrong word. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Right, closing things down, it's like, yeah, that's great. So what we're going to do is think of sort of Glastonbury and the streets, right? It's going to be a big festival. We're going to have these big name acts, hopefully. They're going to be all over the place. We're going to have little people doing, you know, 101 different artistic things, theatre, uh, classical piano, you know, it's just, it's exploding at the moment. So you just don't want to miss it, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, forget the politics, you know, you're coming down for a free festival and it's just going to be all over the place, all over London. Um, and we're just saying to the police, you know, we need this space and, you know, there's rebellion for God's sake and off we go. So those are the, like the five elements to it. So the last, the next little bit is, so how do we actually win? So that's great, Roger, you know, okay, we're going to have, you know, festival, we're going to stay there for a few days. So how does this actually work, you know? Because like so far, as we've said, like nothing's worked, right? No disrespect to people, but we've got to start from that point of, you know, nothing's really happened. And to be honest with you, you know, getting in the papers a day, everyone pats themselves on the back, that's not, that's even on the foothills of what needs to happen. I mean, if you think about it, you know, this is this massive crisis. We need to transform the economy, transform politics in, what, 10 years? I mean, it's just beyond the imagination like mad, okay? So how, how's this gonna happen? It basically happens to what's called dilemma actions. That if you're in the street for several days, as we've established, like the elites and the government and the authorities are not going to be able to leave you there. But that's their first option, to leave you and get on with it. And that's what they've done with small actions, you know, like the blood of our children the other week. You know, it was like outside Downing Street, throwing the blood on the ground. They can let you get away with it. They won't be able to let you get away with blocking central London for five days. But that's their first option. So that becomes like pretty impossible. The other option then is obviously like repression, as it's called. So repression can be two things. It can be violent or non-violent. So a main scenario is please come to us and say, no, you know, this can't carry on, in which case we go fine, then arrest people. So then they're looking at arresting a thousand people, you know, 2,000 people. Like that's completely mad. You know, it's gonna be global news. You know, you're gonna get a 10 year old arrested, you're gonna get an 84 year old arrested. This is a, like a community rebellion. It's gonna be massive news. The last time like people arrested whenever, you know, poll tax, 1968. So if they start arresting thousands of people, we've sort of won because it's going around the world. So what's the third option? They're not going to want to do that. Well, obviously there's another option is they use violence. If they use violence, that's terrible. Everyone knows it's terrible, including the elites and including the population. They're going, hang on a minute. These people are protesting about climate change and they're being hit on the police by, you know, hit on the head by the police. They're like, this is terrible. This is terrible. And so usually when the state uses violence from a sort of social scientific point of view, you know they're on the last legs. I mean, there's no guarantees here, of course. They could clear the streets and that could be the end of it. But they're taking a massive risk. And we're putting them in that position where they have to take massive risks. And the first thing the elites hate is having to take risks, right? They don't want risks. They want, like, stability. So the third option, of course, is negotiate. And our gambit, and it may not work, but this is our best bet, our third, the third, gam the third option is negotiate. Remember, like when you go to the bosses and you go on strike, right? At a certain point, as we said, the accountant comes in, you're losing loads of money. Oh, suddenly, you know, they go from, it flips. You know, if you look at the case studies, it's like, no, 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 no. Yes. You know, suddenly, oh, right, they're going to do it. So suddenly, out of the blue, they're going to go, okay, you know, let's meet around the table. What do you want? And that's when we send the young people in or whatever. You know, young people go in and say, excuse me, you know, we don't want you to destroy our lives and livelihoods for the next generation. And obviously the politicians are going to go, yeah, but, you know, the people that run the show are making too much money, so we won't be able to do that. And then the young people will come out and whatever, and I've got this idea they'll be on the steps, you know, with the world's media watching them, and they'll say, these people still want to kill us. So we'll be out in the streets again tomorrow. End of press conference. You know, because that's it, right? It's pretty simple. And so it carries on. And then we're basically sh shaking the dice. And, you know, people get stressed about, you know, will they give this, will they go for that, or should we go for that? That's not really the story. The real story is for the first time in a generation, 
popular people power have forced a genocidal government to come to the table to talk about the genocide that's happening. And that is going to be massive. That's going to be like all around the world. I like millions of people are going to see it and go, hang on a minute, here's, here's the avenue to create radical change. This is what we've been looking for. So if we don't quite succeed, it doesn't really matter because the joke is the French will come in and do it themselves. You know, someone is going to bring this to fruition and then it's going to spread around the world because it has to, of course, because it has to be a global thing, right? It's no point, you know, carbon neutral Britain, so what, right? <laughs> it's going to be carbon neutral everywhere. And, you know, the research shows this can be very quick, right? You know, all revolutions and rebellions, they just go viral. You know, it was a big thing in 1848. You know, it was a big thing in 1918. It was a big thing in 1968. You know, it was a great big thing in 1989 when the communist regimes. What happens is one regime changes or there's a big confrontation in one regime and everyone else goes, oh, hang on a minute, we can do it ourselves. And, you know, obviously most people know about 2012, right, with the Egyptian revolution. <coughs> And then, of course, we've got this plan, you know, because we're not like the Egyptian revolution. They didn't have a plan. You know, we're not like Occupy. They didn't have a plan. These things were great, but you've got to have a plan. And the plan is, if you read the free demands, we want the government to tell the truth. We need it to commit to zero emissions by 2025. And critically, and most excitingly, we want a citizens' assembly. Because we want these politicians out of the way so that ordinary people, you know, bus driver from Glasgow, you know, caterer from Basingstoke. Normal people come into the room a bit like a jury trial and they decide whether they want to live or die. And if they want to die, fair enough, but we can make a prediction that people don't want their kids to die and they'll go, OK, you know, what's the deal? How do we transform the economy? And once those people are in charge, then you can see some real change and you'll see some legitimacy, of course. So what, what does this mean? What does it concretely mean? OK, so this is the message of this video take two weeks off work okay this is it you know this is what we've been waiting for 30 years this is our first major chance to actually make an impression on this completely out of your head dire situation you know all these carbon emissions have been going up all these governments have been giving us these these promises it's over we know it's over it's done so what do we need to do take two weeks off work it's no big shakes right it really is no big deal and if it is then it is right but this is bigger so that's what we're asking people to do. And come down to Parliament Square, 11 a.m. Parliament Square, 11 a.m. in London on the 15th of April. And don't be late, because it's a rebellion. Okay, and there's the second thing. The second thing is, we want you to work full-time and part-time for the rebellion, okay? Now obviously some people can't do this, but let's face it, a lot of people can. You know, if you give up your job, it's all right, you know, the next day you still exist. So give up your job, get in touch with Extinction Rebellion. People are doing this every day. People are coming into the London office, the Bristol office and going, you know what? This is the most important thing in the world because it is, right? It's the most important thing in the world. Sometimes things are the most important thing in the world and this is it. So they're coming in and going, you know what? I've been working in the city for 30 years, but I've given up my job, you know? You know what? I was a caterer, but that's not important anymore. This is important. And whoever it is, you know, we don't care about people's backgrounds. Everyone's respected in XR, wherever they've come from, whatever their background is. And then we ask them, you know, what do you want to do? We tell them what the options are. And then they integrate into teams and we get on with the job. And we've got like nearly 100 people working part time, full time in London. You know, it's on the way in Bristol. We've got, what, 3,000 people here this weekend. We'll probably recruit 100, 200 people. And that's what we need because. Rebellions, if they're going to organise, be organised and work, then we need people, right? You know, as people might know, right, do lots of research on, on how to create radical change. And one of the most exciting sort of inspirations for people like me is the civil rights struggle in the 1960s. Like everyone's sort of like half forgotten, you know, people think civil rights struggle. Yeah, that was great. Everyone agreed with it. It was obvious, right? But at the time, it was like murderously difficult, literally, right? And there was these students and they said, right, you know, we want to go on the buses with black and white students and, and sit together because, you know, it's pretty obvious, you know, you should be able to do that. But if you go down to, you know, the deep south and what have you, you know, no, 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 can't have black and white people sitting together on the buses. So they sort of said, like, fuck that, we're going to do it anyway. You know, we're going to resist this law, you know, this stupidity. 
So it's sort of similar to the climate thing in a way, you know, you've got this completely stupid situation and people just going, yeah, we're over that. So they get in the buses and they drive, they all going to drive down. And there's a film, you can watch it on, on YouTube, I think it's called uh, uh, Freedom Riders. Okay, so you'll see this in the interview, you watch it and there's this guy going, so, you know, aren't you scared? He's going to this student, you know, this black guy, and he's going, aren't you scared what's going to happen? You know, you could be beaten up, you could be killed, you know. And, you know, you've been worrying about it and what have you. And this student, like, just looks at the interviewer and he just says, I'm ready. I'm ready. And it's like, Phew. it's like, he's just been humiliated all his life, you know. He's just over the shit. And he's just going, I'm ready. You know, I'm just over it. I'm just going to go down there, what will happen will happen. So my message, you know, is we're ready. We're ready, right? Let's get down there. See you on the 15th.